It was supposed to be a joint cabinet meeting at Fontainebleau, the chateau where Napoleon bade farewell to his troops. Instead, it was downsized to lunch at the office between Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz. The French president and the German chancellor insist it went swimmingly, but they canned a joint press conference afterwards. So, just how badly is Europe's Franco-German motor misfiring these days? Macron's called out the bloc's biggest member for going solo on energy security, also angering Paris. Germany's decision to favor U.S. fighter jets over made-in-Europe airplanes as Berlin embarks on a landmark overhaul of its military. It's all down to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Can the EU27 come together as one at this crucial juncture? We'll ask our panel about an Olaf Scholz who's built a reputation as a politician who proceeds with caution. Now the Social Democrats getting blowback from the left flank of his own coalition on these uh, issues and uh, his decision to fly solo to Beijing with business leaders at the start of next month. What's his rationale? Which way for Germany? Which way for Europe? Today in the France 24 a debate, uh, are the French and some EU partners right to feel like it's a case of Germany first? With us is a former French ambassador to Germany, Bernard de Montferrand. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Uh, thanks as well to Elizabeth uh, Humbert Dolfmüller, co-president of SPD International. That's the organization of Olaf Scholz's uh, uh, ruling Social Democrats. Thanks for being with us. Uh, also with us is Swiss journalist uh, Josef de Vec, the author of uh, Macron, the Revolutionary President. How are you? Great. And uh, from Berlin, Cornelia Wall, professor of political science at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. How are you? Good. Welcome. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Oh la la, French tabloid Libération making light of a potentially serious situation with its uh, cover this Wednesday. Uh, so, how did uh, that lunch in Paris go? More from Oliver Farrell. A meeting in Paris after a rocky few months. Emmanuel Macron welcomed German Chancellor Olaf Scholz for a working lunch at the Elysee Palace on Wednesday. But while the meeting appeared cordial, neither side was sharing much with the media. There was no press conference and only vague communiques issued. Schultz's office tweeted that it was a good and important conversation and that France and Germany were tackling challenges together. While a French government source said the meeting was very constructive, it was a cautious approach at a time when both sides remain poles apart on many topics. Berlin is opposing the cap on gas prices in Europe, something Paris is advocating. Germany also wants France to authorise a new pipeline to carry gas from Spain, something France is refusing to do. Like several of its European partners, France was also annoyed by a measure announced by Olaf Schultz, a 200 billion euro so-called defensive shield on energy prices to help German households, something which Paris has denounced, citing a lack of consultation and solidarity. There's also dissension on defence. With its military budget of 100 billion euros, Germany now seems to want to plough its own furrow, favouring the purchase of American equipment to the detriment of European industry. It has also launched an anti-aircraft defence project with the United States, Israel and 14 other European countries, a project which France has declined to be part of. Bernard Montferrand, how bad is it? Have we seen worse before? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's between the French and the Germans, it has always been very difficult. You can remind... Very difficult. Yes. 1963, Conrad Adenauer and de Gaulle signed an agreement between France and Germany. One week later, the Bundestag uh, votes a text which whose spirit is completely reversed to this treaty. Any time we had to make new leaps ahead in the, in the European uh, construction, it was always very difficult for two reasons. The first one is that uh, the Germans are very different from the, from the French and have different interests. And any time we want to progress, we have to, to see where are the interests. What are the interests of Germany in the field of defense? What are the interests of France in the field of defense? And then we talk. And maybe a four eyes lunch is better than uh, 20 people <laughs> big uh, lunch. So uh, 
for me, the only <clears throat> question today is uh, the difference of weight between France and Germany, which means that in the last uh, 15 years, uh, Germany in the economic field has taken a lot more weight in Europe. France has been lagging, and I think this is a priority for France to come back because it, France can and should do it because it's a condition for a balanced uh, uh, relationship. Uh, and the second aspect is, of course, that we uh, we decide we look at strategy and not details. Irritation is a very bad advisor. We have when we have irritations, we have to look the strategy. Is there an alternative? Today, I am convinced that there is no alternative. Germany and France going into different directions. Europe will be in bad shape. There will be many problems, as we see today. So at, at a certain moment, there is a consciousness of this, and we come together. We, if we don't do that, it will be dangerous. Lots to parse in what you just said. Let's start with the, uh, the weight of Germany. We all recall a couple of years back, there was uh, The Economist had it on its uh, front cover, uh, a picture of Angela Merkel under, with the headline, The Reluctant Hegemon. When Germany decides to go it alone with the uh, and at a time when we're trying to come together with a common plan to buy our uh, oil and gas uh, common in a, in a joint manner and says, well, we're going to do a 200 billion euro uh, energy shield, it sort of skews the rest of the market and uh, creates uh, misgivings. It is a way of seeing it. I mean, I would uh, agree with uh, with my interlocutor here, saying that it is one of the crises, and uh, France and Germany have had a lot of crises in the last decades, and I would not be too worried, to be honest. Concerning the 200 billion plan of Germany to boost its economy, the, during the, I don't know if you remember, during the Eurozone crisis, everybody was saying that Germany should do much more public funding. Do more public funding, please. And Merkel was saying, no, we are not doing more public funding, we have to um, uh, respect the Maastricht criteria. And now Germany is doing a lot of public funding, of which only a quarter of the 200 billion, by the way, are for the companies. The rest is for the population who is suffering from inflation, gas price, etc. So I don't think it, it's, it's fair to, to say that now the public spending is not a good thing to do, whereas it w would have been 10 or 15 years ago. So I think it's a good, a good thing that Germany does public spending because Germany can do public spending. Can do public spending, but yeah. it, it it puts Germany's EU partners at a disadvantage. What the what the other partners wanted was a heads up. They said that on the day when uh, when Schultz announced it, uh, he said he had COVID, scrapped uh, a conversation with the French Prime Minister, and instead made this big yeah. announcement. Sure, I mean he had COVID, and then he did his announcement, which for him was probably more important. This 200 billion, because electorally speaking, it's of course an important issue. Probably more important than meeting Elizabeth Bourne, which, I mean, you can say it was probably not, it was a lack of gallantry, probably, for sure. But politically speaking, I think um, this was an important step for him. Um, you don't have to forget that he is inside a coalition uh, with very difficult balances and that this 200 billion was a difficultly um, negotiated package. Well, let me turn to Cornelia Vall in Berlin. Cornelia, by the way, apologies, because you are no longer with uh, Sciences Po. You are uh, now president of the Hertie School uh, in the German uh, capital. Uh, and let me, let me begin by reading you what 10 days ago the French president told uh, financial newspaper Les Echos, uh, accusing Germany of throwing the rest of the EU again uh, out of whack and uh, stating uh, that uh, Germany is uh, right now at a moment of model change whose destabilizing nature is not to be underestimated. If we want to be coherent, what should be adopted are not national strategies, but a European uh, strategy. Again, is it Germany first? I think it's quite accurate to say that uh, the chancellor is under a lot of internal pressure and in a complicated negotiation with his own coalition. 
And uh, as you've just mentioned, the uh, the Zeitenwende, the turn to a new geopolitical consciousness and uh, recognition of the role of Germany in the world is quite recent. And I think what we see now is that um, that has to be learned quite well and is uh, possibly awkward in the beginning. The, the tension is not over the decisions that Germany needs to make. It is over the, um, the lack of negotiation and cooperation or simply a heads up to the European partners. And I think we see that on the issues on which there is tension, energy, uh, European defense or relations with China, um, it is uh, not ideal to have Germany devise a policy for itself and not coordinate it with the European partners. After having written a coalition treaty as, as, uh, as late as last uh, December, where Europe was written all over it. So I think some of that um, geopolitical um, and diplomatic uh, learning still has to be done, and that is what is at stake currently. It's not an explicit Germany first policy. It is, I think, a, a learning curve. A, a learning curve when it comes to uh, timing, it seems. I mean, just as Schultz was in Paris, the German government uh, earlier in the day was announcing that Chinese shipping giant Costco was buying a nearly one quarter stake in uh, one of the port of Hamburg's uh, three terminals. Hamburg, whose former mayor, Cornelia, happens to be... Olaf Scholz. <laughs> so, again, it's this question, and, and by the way, it's not just uh, uh, awkward from here in Paris, but it seems to be awkward from within uh, the coalition. Uh, the foreign minister who's a Green saying this investment, quote, disproportionately expands China's strategic influence on German and European transport uh, infrastructure. Is Olaf Scholz misreading the mood, both domestically and internationally? I think this uh, story tells us how many tensions he has to manage at the same time. Uh, this discussion is very much on the news uh, here in Germany, and uh, the stake that the Chinese company Costco wants to buy has just been negotiated downward to just below a quarter, um, simply because in the German government there is no real majority for it. Uh, four ministers have uh, expressed concerns about the exposure of the critical infrastructure, and between the main pillars of the coalition, uh, this is really not a consensual decision. So you see how much internal politics already goes into it, um, and then uh, let alone the uh, the European or did he have to do this deal? That he also has to take into account. I, uh, did he have to do this deal? Let me say it this way. The economic rationale for it is that it's an important investment um, in, uh, uh, in a time where in this investment is needed. But it is also quite clear um, that this is a critical infrastructure, and a critical infrastructure in the same way that uh, gas and energy are critical infrastructures. And Germany has just learned the very hard way the lesson that um, neglecting the geopolitical aspects of uh, an economically possibly sound decision uh, will come to bite it. So I think this is uh, not entirely over yet, and it has to be considered geopolitically as well. has to be considered geopolitically. Josef de Vec, we've uh, just come out of uh, all of Europe uh, grappling with its dependence on Russian gas. There had been hmm. alarm bells uh, rung when uh, the Chinese bought the port of Piraeus in Greece, for instance. Uh, it, th this announcement coming, and it comes ahead, by the way, of Olaf Scholz, Again, going solo uh, to Beijing on November 3rd and 4th with business leaders. So basically, I think Germany's economy is weakening, and it's not only weakening since February this year. It is weak already since about two or three years, and the main reason for that is China. Uh, over the last 20 years, the biggest growth engine for German, German exports was China. And China is now moving in a direction where growth is going to be much smaller because this is politically wanted. China is, for example, deleveraging its economy. Uh, she is clipping the wings of its tech sector. There is a demographic change. There is also the, the will by China to have an economy that is much more self-reliant. So basically, China is changing its economic model. And the main victim of that is Germany. Um, so, in a sense, there is a real fear that sort of the energy crisis we're talking about right now and say this is hitting Germany, it's sort of the small train that is hiding the much bigger train, that is China's slowdown and, uh, and the consequences for Germany's and Europe's economy. You have to see Schultz's decision to 
to continue and go on with this decision in the Hamburg port to some extent of this. Uh, Germany is really scared if you talk to German business but li leaders. But listening to you, it sounds like he's latching on to a model that's changing anyways. Yes, um, but it's very hard to adapt to a new reality, you know. Um, it's just that the new world that we're entering into is an economic world that is not really in phase with Germany's economic model over the last 20, 30 years. Elizabeth Humbert Duffmuller, you heard uh, uh, Ambassador de Montferrand say at the outset of this conversation that there are tensions always uh, when we're at a crucial juncture for uh, France and Germany, but also for, for all of the European Union. In this case, it's pretty simple. It's because there's war in Europe right now. And does that come maybe before business deals? And yes, we're all going to have to take a hit. Yeah, I mean the war in the in the Ukraine is is a condition of everything which is following. I mean, the German economy will have to ask itself many questions. The decarbonization of the economy was already the first step. Now the second step is that everything the German economy was based on cheap energy and cheap labor is vanishing. Cheap energy because of the war, cheap labor because of the demographic transition transition, and because Germany has not. No people anymore to work. And a third pillar with the exports to China. Yes, the world economy is changing, of course. Um, yes, I would say that the challenge is huge. Olaf Scholz is probably a little bit tetanized by this, I have to say. Um, who wouldn't be? I mean, who wouldn't be um, scared by what is happening right now? The, the German industry has to pay decuple prices for energy right now already. So is this going to be sustainable? No, it's not. So um, in this, there is going to be deindustrialization with all the effects which the prosperity is going to... Do you to approve his decision to go to Beijing? Well, I have to say we have to keep business relations, yes, with the biggest parts of this world. I mean, Merkel did it all the time. I'm, I'm not saying it, it was good. I wouldn't and never say it was good when Merkel, Merkel did it and what is not good while Scholz is doing it. Um, I think German business are extremely um, very much involved into China. There still are, of course, things have to be rethought. Um, but of course, the business is there. And I think the relations with China have to be has have to be somehow taken care of. Yeah, I think so. Bernard de Montferrand, the, the French president, wanted it to be the two of them together going. I think to come back to the French-German relations, I think the subject that we've been talking about have to do with the autonomy of Europe in the, the autonomy or the, the strategic autonomy of Europe in this huge turmoil uh, the world over. And we have compromises to make in the economic field, in the defense field. How much do we want to depend on the outside in economy? The German automobile industry depends on between 40 and 43 percent on China. This is enormous. Uh, Hamburg is the first port of import of Chinese goods in Europe. If I were Mr. Scholz, I would have that very much in mind. So the question is how to combine those facts with keeping, maintaining our independence, our relative independence or autonomy. And this is the same in defense. Uh, we understand very well that the Germans want to have a very strong NATO, which is our case also. But how much do we have to rely 100% on NATO and to, to have our own responsibility? And this is a a discussion between the Germans and the French. In, in the economic field, it's a question of how much should we keep for our independence in Europe? And this is very difficult today to adjust because, as you said, there are crises, there are uh, uncertainties, and the industrial lobby in Germany is much more powerful than in, uh, in France. But we have to deal with that. And the Germans have seen that too much dependence on one country, I mean, Russia in, in gas, and we have told them many years ago, is very dangerous. So we should, we have to, to speak, to deal with China, but with, um, with caution. Lots of lessons from this war in Ukraine. Uh, on Wednesday, Germany's President Frank-Walter Steinmeier found himself in a bomb shelter during an air raid. That's in the uh, town of Koryokivka, 
that's north of the capital in uh, the Ukrainian capital in Chernihiv province. Uh, since February the 24th, the Germans have gone from main conduit of Russian gas imports uh, uh, to actively arming Ukraine. It's a 180 degree turn for a nation that was always wary of militarization ever since the Second World War. How Berlin does it is another matter, a commitment to massively spend more on its own military, raising eyebrows in Paris and Brussels. <coughs> For example, the purchase of up to 35 U.S.-made F-35 fighter jets. The French, who make their own fighter jets, by the way, asking, why not us? Two weeks ago, 14 NATO members announcing plans to jointly purchase air defense systems. Uh, they're talking about Israel's Arrow 3 system, U.S. Patriots, German Iris T's all in the mix. Uh, damit kommt mal unsere gemeinsamen Verantwortung für die Sicherheit. This is a common approach to our joint responsibility for the security of our continent. And we do this by pooling our resources in order to achieve political, financial and technological synergy effects and thus close the European gap in the field of ground-based air defense. A common approach for 14 nations, but they don't include France and Spain and the future combat air system project that was so proudly launched uh, by Berlin and Paris in uh, 2017. Uh, and, you know, we, we've talked about being too dependent on Russia, too dependent on uh, China, but uh, we don't know what the next U.S. presidential election will bring. Uh, is Europe too dependent on the United States for its defense? That's why... In France, since many years, we have been convinced that we had that NATO was our main pillar for defense. But we needed also to have our own capacities in Europe to be able to face certain uh, threats that the Americans wouldn't judge as threats against them. Uh, during the Trump presidency in Germany, there were a lot of um, people who started to say that Europe should do something of her own. And Trump left immediately, that was the end of it. And we still think that it's very important to be able to exist by ourselves in Europe because our uh, interests are very often joined with those of the United States, but not always, and that is very important. So what's so, your personal reaction when the, when the Germans are buying F-35s instead of Rafales? Uh, they have had F-35 for many years, so that's not the problem. The problem is either they put all their, uh, all their wealth in the same uh, basket or not, and I think it's dangerous. We should have a common basket, a common European basket, and if spending on defense for the, for the Germans means under the American umbrella uh, uh, attacking the French uh, defense industry, I think it will go nowhere. They will have some successes, but at the end of the day, it will be a big problem. And for the first time, we had the, this unbelievable project, if our grandfather didn't know that, to build together a combat aircraft. And if we miss that, I am sorry to say that I fear that in the future, it will be very difficult. All right, and that, that project is still... Uh, it's on, still on the table. Still on the table. But, but uh, we, we see the uh, industrial ambitions of Germany. It's normal that German industry would be ambitious. Because right. and, and Cornelia Voll, we heard the uh, head of the German military a few days ago, I'm paraphrasing here, saying something to the effect of, we're sick of these, these projects that remain theoretical forever. We need our, our procurement, our armament now. I think uh, that's that's the challenge. Uh, traditionally, Germany has very, very strongly relied on NATO for its defense, and uh, the French have always had the ambition to work on its sovereignty, also on European sovereignty in the military um, arena, and have invested much in this idea of strategic autonomy that would include defense. And uh, this debate was very theoretical until the war in Ukraine, where it was clear that NATO still has an important role to play, no matter how brain dead um, the French 
Bush considered NATO to have become. So I think NATO remains an important um, important part of the discussion of how to ensure one's defense. And even though the the target vision for the French would be something that is m more European and less transatlantic, um, the Germans are pragmatists and say we have to uh, go ahead. And we are now in a uh, in a, um, a time where we have to make important decisions about procurement and our own military strategy. And you can see that this does not entirely match and that the discussion still has to also um, be about where we want to be in the medium term and in the long term. Where we want to be in the medium term uh, and the long term. And of course, Berlin doesn't always get the last word. Germany's chancellor has uh, been uh, courting Spain and the long-touted Midcat mid gas pipeline from the Iberian Peninsula through France. Uh, here you see uh, Schultz at the start of the month. He was in La Coruña with his Spanish counterpart. And then it was Pedro Sanchez's turn to be invited 12 days later to come to Berlin. This was all in the buildup to last week's EU summits, where in the end, the French president seemed to pull a rabbit out of his hat by instead announcing alongside the same Sanchez and Portugal's Antonio Costa a green energy pipeline that would run uh, from uh, Marseille uh, to uh, Barcelona, thus probably killing Midcat for, for good. Uh, jo jo Joseph de Vec, uh, your thoughts on, on these tensions we're seeing over, first, the scramble to get through this winter, uh, and what's going to happen next when it comes to this? They're still working, by the way, those EU energy ministers, to try to come up with this common plan they promised. Yeah, I think sort of the energy crisis um really shows um, shows a big problem and it shows uh, it, the problem lies there that we still haven't come even though we're sort of eight or nine months after the beginning of this war into a moment where Europeans have really a common plan to look at how they can survive over the next two years and um, and I think Germany is very right um, in a sense to to be opposing this gas price cap and they're fighting this I think economically it's a bad idea to do this it doesn't solve really the problem of reducing demand for energy and at the same time increasing supply but it's not enough for Germany just to say no to this plan uh, what I would wish for is that Germany would say no but say we've got an alternative plan and in a sense Germany has this alternative plan that could work quite well it is what Germany has decided to do in his own country basically if we would reproduce this on a European scale, we would have a great plan, a plan that also makes sense from an economic point of view. The problem with this plan is just it costs money. And, um, and, and who pays? And who pays? And I think it's in this situation, it would be actually good if Europe uh, pays for it and if Germany pays a part of that share as well. Because if we are today in this energy crisis, it is largely because Germany, Austria, Italy, some countries have decided to bet large on Russian energy. And in an integrated market, it means that this bet is now being paid by everyone. Um, so. I believe there's a true argument to be made that, uh, that the macroeconomic response has to be European. And I think Germany would have a good model that it can propose to, uh, to Europeanize. Can there be a consensus on this, Elizabeth humpert Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Let's just remember what happened in spring 2020. With the COVID crisis, you know, everybody was running around like chicken and trying to find masks and uh, vaccines, and it was a chaos. And then slowly the European Commission managed to organize things and, and, and now one can say that the, 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 the vaccination in, within Europe was one of the best in the, in the whole world. So I think it will take some time on this issue, on this specific energy issue, which is, of course, a very difficult one. Because this, as Joseph was saying, means borrowing, uh, it perhaps uh, yeah, like, changing, taking some of that COVID money. and Exactly. Uh, sure. COVID led us to European borrowing, what, mm. which was a very positive thing, in, according to me, and which was, by the way, led by Olaf Scholz as a finance minister then co-led by him. So I think that um, I think that Europe will find, I, I'm not saying Europe will find a way out because this is a real difficult challenge right now, but Europe will manage to unite around this problem. I'm, I'm certain about that. When? It can take some time. It can take a few months. A few months and yeah. a, few, a few months. I don't know. Does Europe have a few months, Bernard de Montferrand? Not much, but uh as you said, uh, when you look back, for instance, in the, after the crisis, during the crisis of 2008, 2009, 
The Germans were opposed to any bailout to any country. The Germans were opposed to any governance of the e of the euro. Uh, the Germans had just very strong restrictions on the common attitude in this crisis. And at the end of the day, Mrs. Merkel uh, decided to, 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 to progress and, and was uh, together with the, the rest of, the, of Europe. So in this field, it's a very difficult because uh, I remind you that energy was not a, a competent a European competence. But if you think today that we are the, one of the richest economic zones in the world, we have uh, with us a sort of enormous weight in, as, a, as a buyer on the market. If we were coordinating at least on, on the international markets, we would have a much more important weight, and that would be very positive. And as this is our interest, I think this will come. Uh, Cornelia Vold, the, you heard Josef de Vec talking about how uh, you have uh, Germany, which bet big on Russian gas. Is there the feeling where you are that uh, there's a resentment that's kind of growing the way it grew in 2007-8 from uh, uh, the Latin countries of Europe uh, uh, over uh, German uh, calls for fiscal purity? I do think that Germany is is conscious of um, the expectations that are on it, and um, maybe I will say that um, the irritation on Emmanuel Macron's and the French government side certainly is that the energy choices of Germany and of some other countries are at the origin of a crisis that now have to, have to has to be borne by everybody, and that's why the expectation would be that we really talk through a European-wide response to energy provision, and it does I think take some time to get there, but uh, I think there's an understanding that we need to get there. The, the German um, uh, stake right now is not just towards France or its other partners, it's also towards the East, um, because I think Germany uh, realizes that the Central and Eastern European countries feel that they've been let down by Germany, which had a very economic approach to energy when everybody was warning about the, um, the vulnerabilities that these energy choices brought with it. So Germany has to, to, to make amends both to the, uh, to the French partners and to the Eastern and Central European countries, and is, I think, uh, embracing this geopolitical responsibility to a certain degree, but in a context where there is very, um, ex very, very um, high expectations also internally, a lot of fear about how energy will evolve over the winter in, uh, inside Germany, and uh, much pressure from the coalition partners on very important uh, fiscal choices, very expensive choices that now have to be made for the military, uh, for the energy crisis. The green transition is, of course, not going away. So this is a, um, is a, is a difficult time to make um, very important policy decisions. And I think Germany has to make sure that it brings all of these expectations under the same, um, in the same, in the same solution. And the European integration certainly is a way forward. We've just heard energy wasn't a, a European area of competence and will now have to be. Um, defense, uh, as you've mentioned, is in the same um, in the same space. And um, we used to say that uh, European integration moves forward in crisis in a way that one can describe as failing forward. Because we hit a wall, we come together, we try to find a solution because we realize that uh, what has been done in the past was not sufficient. Yeah, Elizabeth, adding uh, medicine, of course, uh, to uh, uh, to that to that list. Uh, it's it's though there is a question though, and we mentioned it at the outset. This question of leadership. Uh, uh, he ran a very smart campaign, Olaf Scholz basically pitching himself as con the continuity candidate, even though Angela Merkel was not from his camp. I'm going to be a safe pair of hands. I'm going to move, proceed with caution again. And we heard uh, uh, Bernard de Montferrand describe that, that caution, how it worked uh, in the past. Uh, here, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, yeah. is, uh, is Schultz up to this task? You have to know that Germans love continuity and the Germans love stability. And yes, Olaf Scholz in somehow incarnated that. He was Angela Merkel's finance minister. It was a grand coalition, so people voted for him knowing who he is and what politics he's going to do. Um, I, 
Personally, yes, I'm convinced he's up to it. What I would uh, say is it's a pity that um, um, criticizing Germany is something which is politically very rewarding in, in France in all political parties. And on the other side, criticizing France or Southern Europe is always very rewarding also in German political parties. So this, this is, you know, this is something I regret. But uh, it's, it's the dynamic of this relationship. It's, it's, I don't know if this is ever going to change, but it, it exists, has been existing for decades. Jo Josef de Weck, who, is this the, uh, the same old, same old? Uh, a, a bit of Germany bashing, a bit of uh, uh, what they call Club Med, uh, sometimes disparagingly, the Southern European countries bashing is in, uh, at a time of crisis? No, not really. I think we're in a different moment. Um, I mean, it's sort of, um, we're really in a different moment as in terms that sort of the geopolitics and the economics are changing. For example, it's interesting to see that Germany believes that the sort of epicenter or the point of gravity in Europe is moving towards the east. It believes Scholz, I think he makes clear in his speeches that the Franco-German relationship is not enough, uh, that Germany has to be sort of... Uh, you know, an independent broker, also a bit independent from France, because this Franco-German relationship has also often created resentments uh, towards Eastern Europe. So he thinks of a strong role for, for Europe, for Germany to lead much more and to lead more openly, much more than Merkel. But at the same time, we're actually at a moment of peak economic dominance of Germany in Europe. Um, the last 20 years, this ascent of Germany is now history. If we look at the last two, three years, France has overtaken Germany, for example, in terms of GDP growth. And so I think that the debates in Europe will change. And we're not seeing, for example, in this energy crisis, a debate of the South against the fiscal frugals, in a sense. Because right now it is countries like Germany and Austria, former fiscal frugals, but also southern countries like Italy, who have brought the continent into the energy crisis that we are seeing today. So the camps that are emerging from this crisis are different from the camps that have existed in the past. Bernard de Montferrand, when you think back to when you were appointed uh, ambassador to Berlin in 2007, and you hear Josef de Weck talk about how Germany right now is at its uh, uh, peak height of power uh, within the bloc of 27, uh, your thoughts on what's changed and where it's going now? The problem is not Germany, the problem is France in that case, because we have not done our job. Uh, so we have to do our job to reform and to have, again, a better comp competitiveness and so on and so forth. Uh, the question is strategy. What do we want to achieve? Is it possible to have a, Germ a big Germany leading an uh, Eastern-centered Europe with Which France? the French are very suspicious of. Uh, I don't know if the French are suspicious. The French are thinking as very often, uh, we, don't, we are not good in details, but we have big ideas. The Germans hate big ideas. <laughs> and uh, what we, we have this idea of Europe having a sort of existence, uh, consciousness in, in the world. And today, uh, we, are, we are very rich. We have many ideas, and we, our weight in the world is ridiculous compared to what we could, uh, the, the, the role we could play. And the role we could play could be extremely positive. It, so we have, in matters of economy, to take a certain number of decisions, uh, to know whether we want to have, for instance, European clouds or things like this, which are elementary. We have been talking about that. For, for 10 years, and today when you look at the reality, there is nothing. Uh, we should speak about uh, uh, even that our banks, our financial influence is bigger. It's not the case. The Americans are uh, much better than we are. This is, we have to do that in alone. France cannot do it. Alone Germany could do it, has the impression today that it can do it. I'm not sure. Uh, so. Together we can do it. The, the old say of the goal, we say uh, Europe without a good uh, understanding between the Gauls and the, and the Teuton uh, it doesn't work. It will never work. It has to work. So that's what my hope is that uh, after such a, a lunch, 
uh, strategic consciousness will be uh, will be stronger. Cornelia Vol, when you look at the personality of Emmanuel Macron and the personality of Olaf Scholz, uh, is uh, uh, what uh, Bernard de Montferrand is asking for doable? It's true that they have two uh, different personalities, and even uh, for German standards, uh, Olaf Scholz is, is a rather taciturn and has been uh, accused of not being the most communicative of all politicians one could imagine. But I think um, the the personality of the leaders doesn't matter as much because they do come together in meetings and they can uh, put their differences on a table and discuss it. And we've seen that this has uh, lasted three hours, so I'm sure a lot of things have been uh, dealt with. I think it's very important uh, that that at all levels, and, and that's the uh, uh, the art of diplomacy, at all levels the coordination is tied and sufficiently um, between the French and the Germans and sufficiently important to be taken into account when um, what seems to be a domestic political decision is being made. I think here uh, the, the announcement of the relief package, the 200 um, billion relief package, at a day where uh, there was a meeting with Elizabeth Bourne uh, programmed was uh, a, a diplomatic faux pas. Um, and that shouldn't happen if the uh, if the advisers would have paid a little bit more attention. It's not the communicative style of an of an Olaf Scholz. But um, I think the the, the um, problem load is so heavy that some of these things are bound to happen. And the question is now how we move forward from here and which um, issues can be dealt with between the two leaders. And it's true also that we are in a moment where there is important paradigm change in, uh, in in Germany that has been mentioned in military um, areas, but also with the Maxime that uh, Olaf Scholz and Frank-Walter Steinmeier stand for as much as the past government, and that's the belief that you can change the world through uh, trade connections, Bundle durch Handel. And they still believe um, that. Has been I think they still do, and I think they still uh, try to make the world uh, better by integration, and that, that's something Olaf Scholz has um, also expressed. We will never deglobalize or decouple or uh, go all the way um, into something that would be a more fragmented world. But I think it is also slowly becoming clear that trade is not just a motor of change, but also uh, an exposure to vulnerability um, that has to be dealt with, and that is the, uh, the discussion of the gas pipelines, of the critical infrastructure, and I think uh, the Germans are waking up to this now. Josef de Weck? Yes, I think so. I mean, uh, I also believe in, you know, that it's good to have trade and to have a world economy and to be integrated economically. And I think it has made the world better. The European Union is an example of how this can be but done. But since February, if we had a dime for every time we had a discussion on this set, uh, talking about how, oh, for years we thought that we could bring the Russians into the fold. No, I think the idea basically works, but it just has its big, big limits with autocratic regimes and with dictatorships, where there are politicians in charge that decide that politics is more important than economics. And I think our problem was basically, in a sense, to take this European idea of, you know, creating economic interdependence between us, which was great in preventing another war in Europe, and think we can apply it also to autocratic regimes like Russia and China. And here again, it's okay to sell toothbrushes to them, but not sell your port. Do you agree with uh, with Michael? Uh, sorry, with Cornelia Vol, um, uh, Elizabeth Humperdorff Müller, that there is an awakening in Germany. Oh yes, there is an awakening. Absolutely, German Germans feel themselves very vulnerable right now. Um, it's going to uh, over all political parties, but SPD is. Is spe specifically is, is feels concerned also because of uh, former Chancellor Schröder, of course, who initiated all this, uh, these deals with Russia. And I have to, Schultz, uh, have to say, Scholz was the right, one of the right hands of, of, of Schröder. So there is this tradition, this pro-Russian tradition within the Social Democrats in Germany, for sure. And um, uh, now there is, a, and Frank Walter Steinmeier, the president of the Republic, is also was also part of this group of people. So. Um, uh, they honestly thought that um, commerce and trade would be the way to to be on, on in best terms and maybe to have a bright future together. I don't know. But then uh, Russia is maybe also a bad example because then a lot of irrationality came in. So, I, I mean, breaking into Ukraine was in, in some way is something has been something very irrational. So um, it's not always easy. I mean, it's not always easy to negotiate with dictators, of course, but if they Better are... Better to sell them toothbrushes, as Josef was saying? Yeah, 
I mean, energy is probably not the, right. the best uh, thing to trade with this kind of country. Hindsight sure. is twenty twenty. Elizabeth uh, Humbert-Dorf Miller, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank uh, uh, as well Bernard de Montferrand, uh, Joseph de Vec, uh, Cornelio Vall for being with us uh, from Berlin. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. The history of 